many of you have probably had educational sessions with Marnie before. She's our wildlife specialist in the School of Environment and Natural Resources here at OSU, um, has a, a full extension appointment, works uh, much as I do kind of across the state, works with all different audiences with OCVNers and master gardeners, with park administrative staff and naturalists and um, all kinds of, of audiences related to wildlife, the good parts and also the nuisance parts. Um, a really excellent um, educator. And so I asked Marnie to come in this morning and um, about a half an hour with Marnie on some, some core content. She's gonna focus on um, using native plants to um, attract and create habitat for birds. Uh, welcome, thanks for joining us and uh, teach us about birds and native plants. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, Julia. Happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, good morning, everybody. Always uh, a good day when we get to talk about native plants and wildlife in my book. So let me start by sharing my screen. <clears throat> and hopefully that looks okay. If not, chime in and let me know, Julia or Denise. All right, so I was asked to speak a little bit about um, what I call birdscaping. Okay, providing some friendly spaces for wildlife using native plants. So I'm going to start off right away with the not so fun news, uh, news so we can finish with a more positive outlook. Um, I'm wondering how many of you have seen this research before. Maybe you have, especially if you've heard me speak before. I always tie this in to my birdscaping talks. Um, and so we, what this research is, is showing us is that over um, the past several decades, we have lost 3 billion birds so since 1970. And that it equates to about one in every um, four birds. Sorry, I was just making an adjustment on my screen. And note how we see these declines across all of our guilds. We're not just talking about maybe the birds that we see within our communities and with our cities. We're talking about birds that we see using many different land cover types, grasslands or migratory species, um, species that have certain ecological niches like our aerial insectivores or birds that like to eat insects um, on the wing. Now these declines are due to many factors, but the largest is a lack or degradation of habitat. And so as I said, birds use a variety of land cover types. So this habitat loss and this degradation of habitat is occur occurring across those different land cover types, forests, grasslands, wetlands, and other areas as we change the landscape. So this graphic from Bloomberg shows us how we are using uh, our country for different land uses. Um, so you're looking across and um, just as you're looking at that, can anyone, and feel free to pop it in the chat, can you guess which of these land use categories is the fastest growing in our country? So which one is growing the fastest? Okay, Carrie says cow. Becky says urban, private, rural housing, urban. Yeah, so yep, yep, you guys all have it. So it's the pink areas, okay? Those pink areas that include urban areas, rural housing, that is the fastest growing. So 1 million acres per year. And just to give you a little bit of a, a perspective on how big of an area that is, that would be LA, Houston, and Phoenix combined. So that is, is how much we are developing every single year. So we could focus, let me move ahead here. So we could kind of, um, you know, focus on the negative and say, wow, all of the growth that's going on, you know, we're losing all that potential habitat for wildlife, but um, we, but myself and many um, wildlife biologists are now saying, hey, let's look within these rapidly growing spaces, these areas, our habitats that we're developing and see if there are, there's potential for wildlife habitat. Can these be places of biodiversity? And so now we're moving into the good news, okay? The answer to that, that kind of pondering is yes, they can be. Our green spaces within our developed areas can be um, places where we can improve and increase biodiversity. And 
diving in a, a little bit more specifically at birds, um, there has been some research back in 2012 took place right here in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm located. And um, we found that these green spaces can be critical habitat to uh, migratory birds. So if you recognize this, this patch, um, maybe you don't, it's kind of hard, but if you see Kenny Road kind of running right through here, we are actually looking at the OSU main campus. And this is a place called Waterman Farms and that little woodlot right there. That is where this research took place. This was one of many small little woodlots located in and around the Columbus area. Um, but it's a very urban space, very urban, uh, more a uh, very populated area. And they found it to be critical stopover habitat for migratory birds. So birds that were taking these long journeys, they needed to stop, rest, refuel. And that is what they were using these small spaces for, which was a really, really great finding. Um, and it means that there's really great potential for these small forest patches um, within very developed areas and even outside of developed areas as well. You know, in Western Ohio, where we have lots of small forest patches, great potential to provide these habitats for songbirds. Now, the other um, thing that I, I notice on, on this, um, this aerial photograph, and for those of you that are homeowners um, on this call, and the land that you own is your backyard. I feel you. I'm in the same. I'm in the same position. So you see all of those houses and all of those backyards surrounding that small forest patch. So these backyards also have the potential to be homes for birds and, and butterflies and other pollinators and other wildlife. And so the potential to provide habitat is larger if you're near a forest patch like this. But even if you're not close to a forest patch, you can still provide habitat because the fact of the matter is the more that we do at the local level, the more we're going to see landscape level impacts and create that connectivity of habitat across the landscape. And I strongly feel that this is what we need to do moving into the future to conserve our wildlife populations, um, especially in the face of how rapidly and how extensively we are changing our landscape. Okay. So enhancing backyards or our community spaces for wildlife should center around providing native plants. You gotta put out the base of the food chain, the plants, right? I think you all know this by now in this journey that you've been, that you've been on so far. We know that our wildlife species have evolved with our native plants. And so that should be the focus <clears throat> if wildlife habitat is your focus. So let's remember that we must provide habitat if we want to bring in wildlife species. And habitat is, yes, the place where animals live, but more specifically, it's the food, the water, and the cover or protection that they need, and then the space that they can find all of those things within. And we have to think about providing those things throughout the year and to account for changing needs. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go on and talk about different plants uh, for birds. So when we talk about providing plants for birds, um, we see that our plants provide pretty much everything that birds are looking for out there on the landscape, okay? They provide berries. They're going to attract insects. In this case, we're focusing on, um, oops, on caterpillars because we know that they are a very important food source to birds. They provide seeds and nuts. They will provide um, nectar and in some cases pollen when it comes to our pollinators. And we also know that our plants provide much needed shelter and protection to our birds. So we're gonna kind of look at each of these little components and uh, I'll provide you some lists of some native plants that are going to provide berries, that are gonna attract insects, that are gonna provide seeds, so on and so forth. And I will share this uh, slide set with Denise. So you all will, um, will have these lists. So don't feel like you have to hurriedly jot down uh, the, the lists that are coming up. You will, you will have it. So we're gonna start talking um, a little bit quickly about insects because uh, I think you all have um, listened to talks by Doug Tallamy. Maybe you're familiar with his work. But what he really loves to stress is just the importance of native plants and the connection 
and of what they provide to our wildlife species. And he talks a lot about lepidopterans and caterpillars and birds, which is, it's so great to have somebody researching that and looking into that more closely. And now we have these plant lists that tell us, yes, these plants attract a lot of, of lepidopterans, um, which can be great for, you know, on the pollination side, but also really important in providing bird fruit, food, as you see in this picture. Um, but it's not just all about the caterpillars, got to throw that out there. There are lo lots of other insects that birds will eat as well. But they truly are the little things that run the world, as E.O. Wilson has said uh, for many, many years. And I think a lot of times we put out bird feeders for food and we think we, and we associate birds with seeds. And there are some seed eaters, as we will see, but insects are such a critical uh, component of many of our birds' diets. You can see um, from these statistics on the screen right now, 96% of our terrestrial birds are incorporating insects into their diet. And then 75% of um, our breeding birds in Ohio are looking for caterpillars. So just to give you some perspective on how important that food source really is. And so where are we gonna find a, a good diversity of caterpillar loving plants? Well, our woody plants really host an impressive number of lepidopterans. And so in the background here, you're looking at a white oak. And so we know, thanks to research from Doug Tallamy, that oaks top the list in terms of plant genera that provide for caterpillars. Um, but they're not the only ones, okay? Some of our other woody plants are, are also very good at providing uh, homes for our caterpillars. So we see willow, cherry, plum, birch, maple, and hickory. And again, these are genus, plant genus. So of course we have lots of species within each of those. And that's not to also say that some of our native um, wildflowers, our, our herbaceous plants, don't also um, attract insects. So here are some um, top ones, again, from Doug Tallamy's research. Goldenrods, asters, sunflowers, wild strawberries are some ones that top the list in terms of attracting insects. So if we diversify our backyards and our, our community spaces wisely with these known caterpillar and insect-loving plants, we're going to be providing that food source um, for many of our birds. And I have to say at this point, remember that, again, stressing <laughs> diversity and how important it is. And oaks are great for many reasons, not just for the fact that they attract caterpillars, but they provide lots of food sources and shelter resources for many wildlife species, but so do many other, other tree, species, uh, tree species. So. Um, always remember diversity in the back of your mind, especially if you're landscaping a small space. Um, you really want to try to get as many different plants out there uh, for the wildlife as you can. Okay, so now we're going to move into berries. Um, and we have some birds that are berry specialists. So the cedar waxwing there on the left is a great example of this. Uh, in fact, um, cowbirds that are raised in cedar waxwing nests usually don't survive. And if you're not familiar with cowbirds, they have an interesting reproductive strategy. They um, basically, they lay their eggs in the nest of other birds, thus forfeiting their parenting responsibilities, kind of cheating on that, that whole parenting thing. Um, but cowbirds, when they're growing, they need lots of insects. That's what they need not the heavy fruit diet of our cedar waxwings. So that's why they often don't survive. So just an example of how specialized cedar waxwings can be. But we have many other fruit loving um, birds or at least birds that will incorporate berries into their diets as well. And uh, for some of our birds that happens towards the end of the year when many of our native plants are producing berries. Um, so we see our robins, chickadees, titmice consuming berries. And then of course, many of our migratory bird species will fuel up on, on berries before they leave and make that journey. So we know that the berries are good for the birds, but the birds are also good for the berries or rather the plant that is producing the berries. So I like to always like to mention this um, because it's just a neat, uh, I guess you could say mutualistic relationship between our, our birds and our, our plants that produce berries. So most berries are designed to be eaten by birds so that the birds will consume, in, consume them and disperse them away from the parent plant. Um, and in most cases, this is success, successful, except for maybe uh, this case. But to ensure that these seeds are dispersed, the plant will protect each seed uh, in a fleshy 
pulp and that pulp will be full of sugars and fats and then it's going to wrap it up in this beautifully glossy colorful coat that is going to bring the birds in. So pretty genius on the plant side. So let's look at some plants that are great berry producers for the birds. And that last picture that you were just looking at was a dogwood. Okay, so here's a nice list. All of these lists that I'm sharing with you today are not all inclusive, so please keep that in mind. Let me close that so that's not getting in the way for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so top of the list, service berry. That's one of my favorites, especially for a landscape. Um, it's it's fairly disease resistant. Resistant, excuse me. It doesn't have a lot of issues. Um, beautiful white blooms in the spring and very tasty berries. Uh, if you can get to them before the birds, they're quite delicious. But they've come on early in the summer, whereas many of our, our other native plants are going to put on berries later in the year, uh, as is the case with most of these. But then there are some of them, so there's our service berry earlier, and then the ones that are popping up right now in blue, these are the ones that I tend to um, uh, take note of because they hold their berries into the winter. And so they're going to provide a food source for birds that are staying here and sticking around during the winter. So remember earlier I said, let's think about providing habitat throughout the, the season. And this is a good way to do it. Now, for those of you that have issues with deer, I wanted to provide a short list of plants that are good for the birds, but also less tasty for deer. Remembering, of course, nothing stops a hungry animal. <clears throat> and again, like I said, I will make sure that you all have these lists. As we are talking about plants that produce berries, I have to mention our non-native invasive plants. So in that purple box, you're looking at a list of some that produce berries and that are eaten heavily by our songbirds, unfortunately. We know through research that these berries are not as nutritious uh, as our native plants, but unfortunately, um, the birds don't, they don't recognize that, they don't realize that, or they haven't yet. <laughs> um, and they continue to eat them and they continue to disperse them. So we really need to help the birds out uh, and get these invasive plants out of the landscape. Um, there's many reasons to do that, uh, not, not just for the health of our songbirds. And so if you haven't come across this website, I thought I would share it with you. In Ohio, we do have an Ohio Invasive Plant Council and they're working on several tasks related to uh, managing non-native invasive plants, um, including outreach. And so this is a brochure they have created that lists our invasive non-native plants and some alternatives in the landscape. So there, there's a printed brochure and you can access that at the website there at the bottom of the screen, but then it's all, you know, it's all online as well. So by way of example, we were just talking about honeysuckle and you see some of the recommended alternatives, bottle brush buckeye, which is not really gonna produce a berry, um, but it is going to be a nice nectar source for pollinators. But chokeberry um, and winterberry are two great, um, two great options. And then clethra is, is also a very nice one as well. So I just wanted to make you aware of this list uh, as another tool in your toolbox. Now we're gonna move into some seeds and nut, uh, seed and nut producing plants. So just like we talked about with berries, there are some birds that um, focus on seeds. Here are two good examples. Uh, goldfinch are, are often known as strict seed eaters. And then our blue jays have this really neat mutualistic relationship with uh, our oaks in that they cache thousands of acorns um, leading up into the winter. So if you noticed, a lot of blue jay activity in the fall, it's because they're working on gathering these overwintering resources. And so they bury them oftentimes in the ground um, at the perfect depth that acorns need. And um, of course they don't remember where all of them are and that gives those oaks an opportunity to germinate. So here's some top seed and nut producers. I have some trees listed and I also have um, some herbaceous plants uh, there in the middle. And the ones that are bolded are just reflective of the pictures on the right side of the screen. So we have oak, we have birch, and then um, asters, that purple at the bottom there. So these are all great ones to incorporate into the landscape. 
And I will also mention that if you um, have a pollinator garden or you're thinking about getting some native wild flowers into your, into your landscape, you might decide to leave those plants standing for the birds into the fall and into the winter, okay? Um, so once those, um, once those plants are done flowering, you'll have the seeds that are left behind and they may look empty, but they may not be. So if you leave them standing, any birds that are sticking around here over the winter have that food source. Um, depending on your planting, you may also be providing some nice shelter and cover with uh, those standing plants. So that might be another reason to leave it standing, even if all the seeds you think are gone. Um, so there's not really a specific time to, to cut them down, but you know, in, in my garden, I usually just um, leave them standing until late winter um, or very, very early spring. And then I try to cut, cut some of the, the uh, more woodier, um, stouter stems, be, um, I cut them off and leave about one to two foot stubble, and um, then they can be used by native stem nesting bees. Okay, so let's move on to some nectar sources. Specifically, since we're talking birds, we're gonna be talking hummingbirds, but um, as you all probably know, these can also be great sources for some pollinators as well. We do know that our hummingbirds are attracted to red. That's why many of our hummingbird feeders are red in color. So incorporating uh, some red plants into the environment is good, but once you get your hummingbirds into your yard, they're going to visit many flowers. So a, a nice list for forbs or flowering plants is on the right side there. Cardinal flower is the picture that you see there, and it really is the perfect example of a great hummingbird plant. It has those long tubular flowers, which fit the bill of a hummingbird. Um, they're horizontally positioned, so it's very easy for that hummingbird to just hover and get a drink. Um, so that's kind of what you're looking for. But really, uh, uh, many of the plants on the right side are going to provide um, a good nectar source for our, our hummingbirds. And I will also just remind you that our hummingbirds are also insect eaters as well. So again, plant diversity is going to bring in the insects, and that's going to provide another food source for our hummingbirds. Here are some trees um, and, and shrubs and vines that are uh, nectar producing for the birds. Um, so many of these are going to be great for hummingbirds, but I also wanted to share this little video um, that I uh, recorded, I think it was just this past spring. This is the weeping cherry uh, in, fit the bill, very funny, thanks Denise. Um, this is the weeping cherry in my front yard. And I drove, I, I pulled into my driveway and I noticed that it looked like my weeping cherry was snowing. And there's a bunch of petals on the ground. I was like, what is going on? It hadn't been windy, so I know they hadn't blown off. And as I looked, I'm going to play the video and let me mute it so you don't. Okay. And sorry, it's a little wavery, but if you see, those are some house finches right there, eating the petals and then dropping them. So I guess I shouldn't say eating the petals. What they were doing is getting the nectar out of the petals. So they would pluck a petal, kind of chew it a little bit and then let, the, let them fall. And you can see them kind of raining down or snowing down. And I, I saw them doing this several times. And I later talked to some of my horticultural folks and they're like, oh yeah, I've seen that before with crab apples and you know, um, different birds will sometimes uh, take advantage of that nectar source. So that was a learning experience for me. I haven't, I haven't really gone to the literature to see how often that happens, but uh, I thought I would mention it as kind of a another kind of bonus if you're looking at putting out some of these early blooming plants. Okay, so Nancy asked, what about willows? Um, what type fit this insect bird feeding source? Okay, so willows are um, one of the plants that are our are, are genus that are really good at attracting lepidopterans. And so they're going to provide a caterpillar food resource for our birds. Um, many of our willows like wet feet. So we often see them growing uh, near waterways. For example, the pond in my backyard has willows growing around it. Um, so in that case, they can sometimes be important nesting spots for some of our birds that like to hang out a little bit closer to the water. Um, redwood blackbirds, um, yellow warblers, for example. So they can kind of provide that shelter and nesting resource as well. And as Denise is saying, yes, willows are fantastic um, as a pollen and nectar source for our bees as well. 
Um, red mulberry. So mulberry is, yeah, birds love mulberry. We know that they do. If you unfortunately park your car under a mulberry tree, you will have bird poop all over your car. So we know they like it. It's just, uh, it's messy. It's very, very messy. And is it the white mulberry? I think that is invasive. Uh, I'll have to check that one. Um, but yes, it's good, but it's, it's messy. So it's not one I usually recommend planting in the landscape, but if you have it and it's away from anything that's going to, you know, the, the berries and the birds are going to poop on, then yeah, leave it. Yeah. White mulberry. Thank you, um, Shana. All right. Looking at my time. We're almost done. Okay. Uh, since we've talked a little bit about nectar and pollen and, and pollinators, this is a, a list I often share when I talk about landscaping for both birds and pollinators. And I'm just sharing this to kind of nail the, the point home that providing for birds, oftentimes you're going to be providing plants that are great for our pollinators. So um, these two objectives go hand in hand, which is, which is lovely, you know, um, because I find that most people that are interested in bringing in birds are interested in bringing in pollinators and, and, and vice versa. Um, so a nice little list here uh, that is, you know, attractive to both our pollinators and our birds. Last but not least, we'll talk briefly about some plants that provide cover for birds. And when I say cover, remember, I mean shelter, uh, and protection from weather and predators, but I'm also, in the case of birds, referring to a place to nest. So by that definition, many of our trees and our shrubs are going to provide cover for birds, especially if they're arranged in a way that reflects nature. So I'll expand on that just a little bit. So areas like the picture on the left are beautiful and can definitely be uh, provide some resources for birds if we're choosy about the plants we're incorporating. But the, the spot on the right, that is really what wildlife uh, prefer and what they're looking for. So those spaces that are a little bit more overgrown, a little bit more dense, maybe a little more unkempt, that's what is really going to appeal for birds because that's what we see out there in nature. But we do know that some of our, our trees and shrubs um, are kind of, you know, above uh, the rest in terms of providing nesting and cover. So those plants that have dense structure, uh, like willow, as we just kind of talked about, hawthorn is another great one that provides great nesting habitat for birds. Um, rubus, okay, some of our rubus, our blackberries, black raspberries can provide some great shelter holly and conifers, those evergreens that retain their leaves uh, uh, over the um, winter are going to be excellent. I don't know if anybody has been uh, noticing the murmurations of starlings, the flocks, giant flocks of starlings, but we had one in our backyard uh, just the other day and it was so cool to watch. But as they were moving to another place, a hawk flew into the murmuration and they just scattered which was neat to see in and of itself. Um, but they ended up returning again to the pond behind my house. And there is uh, a conifer back there. And it was so cool to see the birds that had been chased by the hawk. They just flew straight on to that conifer and just you know, took advantage of that shelter. There was a cottonwood, but of course it didn't have leaves. So they just went to that dense and protective cover. It was just really neat. You know, we talk about it, we know that they provide good protection, but it was really neat to actually see it happen. Okay, and then uh, the last little bit there I have is some nesting material. So some of our plants provide um, nesting material to some of our birds. Let me pop up this picture. Here's our little um, uh, American goldfinch and you see that it is pulling some, it, it's called pappus, I think, but I call it fluff <laughs> from some thistle. And so some of our birds will look for these softer materials to line their nests right before they lay their eggs, kind of creating a nice little soft cushy space. And um, the plants that you see there under nesting material are some great ones that can do that. We have a lot of native thistles. Um, we hear a lot about Canada thistle, which is a nasty one. We don't like that one, but there are a lot of native thistles out there. And so this is a nice publication from Xerxes Society if you wanna explore some of those native options a little bit more. And if uh, you didn't get enough lists, you can check out my blog, The Wild Side at OSU. 
Um, it's a fairly new blog that I started uh, when the pandemic started. So I'm working on, on getting more articles in there, but I've been enjoying adding some resources. So check that out if you're interested. And in closing, I'll just remind you that when we green our living spaces, um, we are connecting to nature. We are providing a chance not only for ourselves, but our youth to make that connection, which is so important. Um, so these are my two daughters. And one of my biggest joys is that they can just walk out the back door into their backyard and see things like this. So big thanks for me to you for your passion, for your interest in nature. And I will leave you with this nice little quote from Rudolph Bennett. And he said way back in 1946 that this topic is what we should be talking about, you know, discussing the management of songbirds and wildflowers and biota of a city. And so um, I'm glad that we were able to do that this morning. Thanks, everybody. That's great, Marnie. Thank you so much. Um, there, let's see, there was at least one question in the chat box. So guys, we're going to spend uh, you know, 10 minutes or so on um, some questions that you may have. You can either put those questions into the chat box or if you'll put in um, two question marks into the chat box, um, that way we can kind of figure out who has questions and wants to unmute and, um, and share those. So Chris had a question about American Beautyberry, um, that uh, beautiful shrub with the bright purple oh, yeah. amethyst, uh, berries. Um, any thoughts on that for, for birds? Yeah, that can definitely be a resource for birds. I don't know off the top of my head how popular it is with birds, but um, yes, it can definitely be a resource. Uh, I think there, I mean, we're, we're still learning a, a lot about this topic, you know, as there's an interest in native plants and this connection with them and wildlife, um, we're learning more. And there are resources out there. We know that certain plants are good, but as far as, you know, how much they eat and where they rank, it's kind of hard to say. Um, so I can't say specifically where it ranks, but yeah, it's going to provide a, a, another berry source for birds. And I would encourage all of you, you know, um, as you put these plants out, just pay attention and take note as to which are popular, because I think, um, you know, that anecdotal information is going to be helpful as well. Yeah, great. Uh, Marty and I are working on um, fact sheets for natives that are good for shrubs, natives that are good for trees, and uh, we're not sure exactly when they'll um, be finalized, but we're definitely working on them. <laughs> they are. <they're, laughs> we yeah, found it. I think it's fair to say it was much more challenging than we thought it was going to be when we hit the literature and really tried to like say this one's good because you see it out there, but then when you really try to find okay, where has this you know really been found? It's harder. Um, so yeah, but yes, they are coming. <laughs> I think um, one of the areas that was has been most difficult for Marnie and I is the is hummingbirds yes. and what hummingbirds actually visit and and you know really not just anecdotal but um, looking at studies yeah. to identify yeah. that and it's been really challenging. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, Marnie, I'm sorry if you mentioned this and I was kind of busy trying to let people in and, and such, so I may have missed. Did you did you mention poison ivy? Oh, you know I didn't, and thank you for that. Um, Poison ivy is a fantastic resource for birds, which kind of surprises some of us. But um, if you've noticed that towards the end of the year, they get greenish berries that then turn a little bit white uh, towards the end of the year and they are gobbled up by birds. And when you think about it, the prevalence of poison ivy and how it shows up in these random places, it shows up in my flower bed, it's the birds, right? So they definitely like it. Um, and it's one of those plants where I say, if it's not bothering you, if it's not in a place where it's bothering you, then, then leave it. Um, if it's not crawling up a tree that is providing some other um, or filling some other objective or need for you, then leave it. Um, and I think the same can be said for grapevines or native grapevines. They also can be a great resource for birds. Um, once the vines get thick, they have that bark that peels off that some of our birds like to use as nesting material. So that's another great resource for birds out there. And another one that you can, you may consider leaving on those trees that aren't providing another um, resource or serving another, um, uh, filling another objective need for you. Okay, great. Uh, Lynn notes that uh, bluebirds are working on the berries on her evergreen holly. Uh, and I have yes. robins working through the um, winterberry decorations on my front porch. So <laughs> some seasons that those berries hang around and the bluebirds get a chance, but this year the robins have really just swooped in and, and cleaned those out. 
I've noticed that too. My mother-in-law said that too. She's like, I had berries this morning and then this evening I had none on her holly bush and it was the robins as well. Yep. Uh, let's see, Jennifer had a comment about um, calibrachoa in her hanging baskets, uh, um, a non-native, I think it's a non-native, at least definitely not a um, Ohio native um, bringing in hummingbirds. So any, any comments, Marnie, on some of those other plants that are great for hummingbirds as nectar sources? Yeah, I think so. You know, the whole, the whole question of non-native versus native, that's again, an area where we have so much to learn. Um, and, you know, I, as I say, I stand by what I said, if your main focus is attracting wildlife, you want to focus on native plants, but that's not to say that some of our non-natives do not also provide resources. We know that they do. So if you found a plant and your hummingbirds like it, great. You know, um, I would just encourage you to get some of those native resources into the landscape as well. Um, I was trying to think of some, uh, so, okay. So, well, yeah, I'll, I'll end it there. <laughs> I'll end it there. So yeah, there are definitely some of those non-natives, um, that are attractive, especially in the case of hummingbirds. Okay. A couple of cedar waxwing observations. Deborah mentions that cedar waxwings love her service fairy, mine too. Um, and, um, Oh, that was a, a Baltimore Oriole comment from oh, cool. NC um, about them working on the blossoms of a giant old apple tree. So, oh, pretty- that's cool to know. Baltimore Orioles too. Nice. Yeah. Well, that that and that makes perfect sense since Orioles definitely incorporate a good amount of sweets and nectar into their mm-hmm. um, into their diet. Um, Some Chris, uh, like coleus and pots too. Awesome. Uh, Chris has her question marks in the in the chat box. Um, Chris, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Oh, yeah. Yes, I would love to because I was watching my beauty berry this morning and there was a wren and a mockingbird in it and they were both peacefully chomping. I wanted to kind of know, like nutrition wise, is it good compared to the others? Because it was on none of the lists. But also this mockingbird is a bully and it's (laughs) chased everything off of our feeder It chased the wren out of that bush after a couple of minutes. And it's really an annoying presence. And I want to know what to do about it. Oh, it chased away the um, woodpeckers, the um, red belly woodpecker were they were fighting and it was awful. Oh, that's a tough situation. It is. Um, it, it really is because anything that you're going to do to scare the mockingbird is going to scare the other birds away as well. Um, yeah. My husband suggested that we observe it, watch where it nests and try to remove the nest. So you can't do that because knocking, uh, our mockingbirds are a native species. So our, our native bird species are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So you okay. can't, um, you can't okay. damage their nest or their eggs or of course the birds themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, what I would say is there's no um, guarantee that that mockingbird is gonna stick around to nest uh, when it comes around to nesting season. Right now, our birds are moving across the landscape uh, and it's largely dictated by food resources. So they may just be taking advantage of your beauty berry and, and other foods that you have out there on the landscape. And when spring hits and there are more resources, they're likely to disperse uh, and go somewhere else to nest. I, so, I have a history with this guy and he was- Oh, you do? <laughs> yes, he was here last spring. And for two weeks, it's saying morning and night right outside my bedroom window. Oh, so, yeah. okay. Well then in that case, I think some harassment is probably warranted. Uh, so if you can, you know, if it's near and around your house, you can try some um, hawk or owl decals on your window. Uh, you can, do you feed the birds with bird feeders? Do you find the humming or the yes. mockingbird? Yes, so, yes. But I have resident hawks too. We have a red shoulder and coopers. Yeah. And that doesn't bother them at all. <laughs> okay. That's enough so about tough them. mocking birds. Yes. Yeah. I think some light harassment might be might be uh, a good thing for you to try. And especially you. as you're approaching that nesting season. Thank and you. Even I don't want to monopolize yeah. the conversation. No, that's Thank fine. You. That's fine. Thank yeah. And as we get closer to the nesting season, if you can figure out where they're nesting, 
And you don't have to do anything to the nest, but if you can make that nesting site uncomfortable, noisy, sprinkler, or something like that to make that spot uncomfortable, then maybe that would encourage them to move somewhere else.